Stanford University. Welcome to this week's EE380. Uh, if you're expecting an Intel talk, sorry, uh, it's been rescheduled for spring. Um, EE380 is about, electronic it's about electronics technology and usage. And it tends to be about when it's about usage. It tends to be about what we can do with electronic systems to make things possible or better. The assumption is generally that the environment is either trivial or it's a, it's a problem that we get to solve and yay us. Um, that doesn't reflect reality. The best sensors in the world are completely useless if they can't get to where the data is, to, to where they can pick up the relevant data. And that's what makes today's talk different. The ocean today is largely unknown, not because we don't have decent sensors. It's because we can't get the sensors to where the data is. And that turns out to be a motive energy problem. Roger Hine, today's speaker, and his co-inventors at Liquid Robotics came up with a clever way to use the ocean to provide motive force. Um, and I want to say something clever about considering how long people have been looking at the ocean. Uh, insert your own joke there. <laughs> of course, once we have a way to move, we're back to 380, to, to, to familiar 380 ground. Autonomous robots, power limited computing, low bandwidth, hostile environment. Yay us. <laughs> this talk also, though, reminds us of, well, the, of the breadth of technology that is in Silicon Valley. Electronics may be ubiquitous and essential, but it isn't the only, but other things are important too. We have a lot of little, or not so little companies around Silicon Valley that do simply amazing things that aren't Facebook, Google, Microsoft, or computer companies. Roger Heine. Thanks a lot. Okay. Well, it's, it's great to be here. I did look at the colloquium and, and think what is, this is an electronics engineering computer science colloquium. It, it seems um, um, a, a bit of a stretch for me. I am neither, certainly. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I'm also not an oceanographer, but I thought that it might be appropriate to start out with a little bit of a primer on ocean observation, um, what it is, why it's challenging, and why it's important. Um, you may have realized that the planet is covered mostly in water. 72% of the ocean is, of the planet is ocean. Um, this is, if you play with Google Earth, you can spin it around and get to a point where you can see almost nothing but. Um, it should be self-evident, but sometimes it's not, that with six and a half billion people approaching seven billion, growing at 100,000 people per day, living on this planet, understanding the ecosystem and, and and how we interact with it is not just an academic question. It, it, it may, in fact, become an existential question. And you cannot do this without looking in depth at the ocean. And the ocean's a diff difficult place to observe. Um, quite tangibly, we get a lot of food from the ocean. Uh, the number one source of animal protein for humans is fish. Uh, it's about a $200 billion a year industry. And about half of that right now is aquaculture, fish farming. Uh, the, the marine capture fisheries uh, the, the capture from marine fisheries peaked in around uh, 1996, and it's been level or declining since then. That's not for lack of trying, but the fish simply are not there in the numbers that they used to be. Um, that's one example of, of the importance and some of the change that's happening in the ocean. Um, another thing that is well known um, is uh, greenhouse uh, uh, effect, global warming. Um, well, the carbon cycle um, about 5.5 petagrams, or, or I think that's the same thing as a gigaton, of carbon is put into the atmosphere, apparently through anthropogenic sources each year. Well, about 90 gigatons comes out of the ocean. Um, 92 goes back in. So the net change there is about 2 gigatons, but it's a huge variable in this equation that needs to be understood. It's, it's, we don't have CO2 sensors throughout the ocean at this time. Um, so th there's, there's a lot of inference. There's a lot of solid data, but there's a lot of inference. Um, uh, this relates to global warming. It also relates to a parallel um, problem that, it, that is related to CO2, which is ocean acidification. So that net two gigaton <coughs> rise per year 
uh, maybe increasing the pH uh, or increasing the acidity of the ocean, um, that makes it more difficult for organisms that build shells to grow, coral or shellfish. Some of those are quite small pteropods or the little uh, nearly microscopic snail creatures that young salmon eat, for example. Um, these changes are, need to be understood better. Um, you're probably aware of this. This is quite a famous uh, um, piece right now that's in the news. Uh, this is from satellite observations of the ocean that uh, document the uh, shrinking of the polar ice cap. Um, some other uh, changes that are happening in the ocean maybe are less well known. And, and, and this one, I think, is interesting because it highlights the importance of ocean observations and the difficulty of them. Um, this, th this data comes from a group in England um, that has been running since 1931 a continuous plankton survey. The, the apparatus, as you can imagine from 1931, is, is, is quite simple. It's a thing that gets towed behind a ship. Um, plankton go in one end, and they get caught in a scroll. The scroll advances because a propeller drives a gear mechanism. So it's all mechanical. And what it does is it keeps a record of, this, of the plankton where that ship transected. Those scrolls are then brought back to a lab. They're laid out, and they count what types of plankton were discovered. Most of the data is centered around England because the, the study was there, but it is global. The, the, the ship transects have been expanded, and they're, they're, they're expanding this network. But some of the changes that they've documented are, are fascinating. The, one of these species of uh, zooplankton that in the 50s to 80s period was mostly in this region, you can see how it's been changing over time. That, that migration right there is this ocean equivalent of the Saharan climate moving to Italy and the Italian climate moving to Germany. We don't see it. It's in the ocean. We wouldn't even know about it were it not for these guys dragging around their plankton recorders. Um, so th that's not been done globally. We really, you know, what other changes are happening biologically in the ocean that are unobserved? Um, so oceans are important. Ocean observations are important. How do we do it? Um, well, the most traditional way of observing the ocean is through ships and buoys. We've been doing this for, for quite a while, um, and it's quite difficult. Um, this is a more recent picture. Uh, the buoy, buoy technology is evolving uh, quite rapidly and, and improving greatly. Um, the ocean, on average, is two and a half miles deep. Ships go you know, about 25 miles an hour. You, you saw you know, okay, the scale of things. How long does it take to go from Palo Alto here to here? 25 miles an hour. It's a, it, it, it's a considerable effort. Um, you're not going not only in time, but the size of the ship, the fossil fuel, fuel used to get there. Um, these are it's 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 an important activity, but it's not an easy one. Um, I don't think these guys were going 25 miles an hour. Um, sometimes they break free. Um, they have to be recovered. They have to put back. So a lot of effort goes into ocean observations, and in no way is what are what we doing at Liquid Robotics with the Wave Glider going to displace this? It, th these are complementary efforts. I'm just trying to give a feel for how it's done and what, what, what it takes to, to take measurements about the ocean. Satellites, of course, are where we get most of the, the, the information, certainly in, in terms of the quantity of data about the ocean. We've launched 19 satellites in the last decade um, dedicated to ocean observation. Um, they take fantastic images, and they measure a large number of variables. Um, Sea surface temperature, this is wind data, uh, sea level, um, and this is ocean color. Uh, the, the biology of the ocean is perhaps the most difficult thing to observe. We, we measure a lot of physical factors about the ocean, but the biological factors of the ocean are, are more difficult to observe. Ocean color is one thing that the satellites can actually provide the biologists. Just a question. How do they yeah. measure wind, wind direction and uh, it's um, scatterometry is the is the name of the of the, of the technology, and um, I couldn't tell you in detail how that works, but uh, Google scatterometry and and uh, and you'll learn. I can tell you that. Yeah. Offline. Yeah. So okay. okay. Um, uh, this is a uh, a beautiful image of um, from a satellite, and and I bring it up just because if you look at the the complex patterns of mixing here, um, there's actually recent work that's been um, occurring in Monterey Bay. Um, that is aimed at understanding these patterns of mixing and really suggesting that this is not chaos, this is just complex. It is actually predictable. If you have the data and you have the modeling, it is actually predictable. But it's, it, it, it shows sort of the challenge, you know, the satellite's only looking at the surface, what's happening below. You need in-situ measurements to see that. But an in-situ measurement, you know, it's very different if you're here versus here. 
how do you know where you are in this, in this mix? So um, you need a combination of approaches to understand these phenomena. And you need both in situ, you need satellite, and you need to aggregate that data. Um, drifters are another approach that are used for um, uh, measuring data. The, the Argo program uh, is a, it's been a huge success in physical oceanography. Uh, it's an international effort. We've deployed 3,319 uh, floats as of July of 2009 um, all over the world. Um, these floats spend most of the time at depth, about 2,000 meters below the surface. And then they come up and they take a profile of salinity and temperature and depth and transmit that data. And then they go back down. But they are adrift. So that means that you can't put them near shore. And they tend to move away from upwellings. Their position, they, and, and also you need ships to, to deploy all of them. So a lot of effort gone into this and, and really invaluable uh, data as to the structure of the ocean in 3D. What proportion of the time is spent sitting at the bottom? Well, about two weeks. Two they, weeks. They sit at the bottom for about two weeks and then come up. And so that's really driven by uh, power. You know, you'd like to have more data, but uh, the, they, they're also battery operated vehicles and they want to last for about two years. Um, um, Recently, there's been a lot of innovation in autonomous vehicles. Um, a, a, a different approach that sometimes we get confused with, this it, partially because of the name, um, Sea Glider, is one of the buoyancy propelled gliders that are out there. Um, buoyancy, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, clever idea. It's the, the Sea Glider is, uh, was developed at the University of Washington APL. The original concept, I believe, came from Scripps. There's a number of organizations that are now making buoyancy propelled gliders. Uh, their basic concept is um, that they will uh, glide forward as they sink and then expend energy when they reach the bottom of the profile. And this is the only time that they actually expend energy for propulsion by inflating a bladder. Now they will rise to the surface and they can glide back up. So gliding down and gliding back up, they can travel quite a distance with a only minimal expenditure of, of energy. Um, in, in th th this, this puts them in a, you know, it, they're a very different category than, than what we're doing with a wave glider. They're, they're a submarine and we're a, we're a ship. Um, they also are reliant on stored energy generally. There is, a, there is a class of buoyancy propelled glider that actually extracts energy from thermal gradients. So they're energy harvesting. It's colder down deep reliably and it's warmer up, up top reliably. So you can extract some of that thermal energy. But generally for the payloads, they're still reliant on, on battery power and their mission duration and the amount of data that they can collect, the power limitations are, are very fundamental. Um, and there's other ways. Um, uh, here, a, a volunteer observer, or I'm not sure he volunteered, but um, uh, he, he got to take some data. I think he's measuring uh, conductivity and temperature. It's actually a very, been a very useful way of getting uh, data in areas that are difficult to get to. These guys go to amazing places. And they tell us about their lives, where they go. But they're also gathering physical oceanographic data as well. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a long introduction. But now we, now we get to, to WaveGlider. So what is WaveGlider and how is it different? Well, what it is, is it's a persistent mobile platform. It's a surface platform. And it's 100% energy harvesting. So uh, it, it harvests energy from the sun and from the waves. And therefore, its mission duration is not really limited by its battery stores. The, the basic principle of the, of the wave glider, the thrust generation principle, um, is explained in this cartoon. As the float is lowered by a wave, fins on the glider rotate passively. They, they, they are pivoted at the leading edge. Springs return them to a neutral position. The fluid force on the bottom tilts them up so that the, the glider now dives forward. On, as the float is lifted by a passing wave, water pushes the wings back down, again, passively. Um, it now thrusts forward on the upstroke. So if you just sit here holding the sub portion of a wave glider by its umbilical and pull it up and down, it'll try and swim forward. All we have to do is steer it. Um, so the only actuator in the system, not shown in the schematic, is a rudder that's at the tail of the glider. And that rudder, we just have to steer infrequently to keep it going in the direction that we want to have it swim. Is the weight that keeps the fins down? That's right. Well, the, the fin, you can do it a variety of ways, actually. But the the, the glider itself is heavy. So if you cut the umbilical, it would, it would dive forward at a very steep angle. Um, well, about a 45 degree angle. Um, uh, so the fins are actually returned to a neutral position by a spring. Um, and you're pushing against the spring. Um, yeah. Are you expected? Is that a critical feature? Um, there's. Uh, uh, yes and no. There's, there's, a number, there's actually quite a bit of nuance into the, the wing design. 
um, and the and the architecture of this uh, vehicle. And unfortunately, I'm a little bit restricted, in, you know, or I want to be a little bit cautious in how much I, I put out, just to, um, because this is a, a bit of our uh, secret sauce, if you will. Um, but uh, but I so I want to get the fundamental principles, um, and I think this uh, this explains that. Um, why the springs won't corrode with the chlorine in the, in the ocean as well as the buildup of life, which is a common problem. Yeah, so, so <clears throat> metal corrosion, anti-fouling, uh, these, are, these are the, this is my world. <laughs> um, uh, it's a, they're, they're really challenging problems, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I will talk a little bit more about that coming up. Um, What's that? You actually did Extract some energy I'll, for. Let me come back to that because because so I actually well, well let me say first off right now the vehicle has a very clean partition of, of energy, all of the thrust comes from the waves, all of the the electricity comes from their solar panels. Um, in the early days, we never thought we could have actually created something quite so simple. We thought surely we would have an auxiliary thruster. <laughs> well, uh, no, because there's batteries, right? So, 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 yes, yeah. See, yeah. Uh, so, you, you, it's not, it's not operating without batteries. Um, the batteries buffer the periods, not just at night, but dark storm periods. Um, and uh, and so, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail. Um, let me just talk just a bit more about the thrust principle. Um, when you watch a wave move across the surface of the ocean, the water itself is moving in an approximately and you know this is all nominal, but in approximately a circular orbit. So if you watch a duck or, or something floating, it'll it'll move in a circular orbit and end up right where it started after the wave passes. Um, the diameter of those orbits decreases logarithmically with depth, such that when you get to a, a depth of about one half the wavelength, there's nearly zero motion. So the the basic principle here for energy extraction is we put something where there's a maximum motion, we put the other part where there's reduced motion, and we can extract energy from that. Um, the, the, the length of the umbilical, well, about seven meters is a good compromise. Depending on where you're operating, depending on what the sea state is, a different optimal length would be, uh, would be there. You know, the longer, the more energy you can harvest, but it's also more drag. Um, the, the genesis of the idea actually came from a, a quite a different observation. Um, if you are a kayaker, for example, um, in Hawaii, uh, we're, we're from liquid robotics uh, got started in Hawaii, the concept anyway. Um, if you're a kayaker in Hawaii and you get an offshore breeze, it can be a very dangerous situation. Um, the wind will be, you'll, you'll have the full force of the wind in your chest. The surface layers, most of the energy goes into wave generation, but the surface of the water does start moving and you get white caps and you can get blown out to sea. Um, scuba divers have learned, and are actually are usually taught, that you have to be careful because you can be just 10 feet down and a gale will pick up at the surface and you won't even realize it. It's just, it's that much calmer, just a little bit below the surface. So the concept was, let's put the mass of the system where it's calm and have as little as possible at the surface and keep it, have, a, have a station keeping buoy. And that really is, you know, a two-part vehicle, believe me, you wouldn't go through the trouble of, of an umbilical and the snap loads and all the abuse that it's gonna go through if it wasn't a, a, a really a key part of why the wave glider works so well. Um, it's a wave-powered vehicle. What about when there's no waves? Um, so we've had a lot of opportunity and a lot of design effort gone into optimizing its performance in calm conditions. Here's a few pictures of it moving along in calm conditions. Rough conditions, um, the other end of the spectrum, you've got a lot of extra energy. Difficult to take pictures in rough positions. So I, we, we've been actually in rougher conditions than this. Uh, but uh, the challenge there is really not one of efficiency, it's one of durability. Um, the, in, in this picture you see, this is another slide that's actually addressing the same point, calm conditions here. Um, story about Hurricane Flossie. So in um, August of 07, Hurricane Flossie was approaching Hawaii. Um, we had early, earlier prototypes in that, in that era than we do now, and a lot of the work that we've done in durability hadn't been done at that point. Um, we had about four of them out in the ocean, um, and a few days before Hurricane Flossie, uh, was going to hit the island, we thought it was, the governor was, you know, warning that it was going to be a state of emergency and uh, looked quite serious. So we decided to pull the vehicles out. Um, we got two of them out and, and we were using a friend's boat because she had a bigger boat than we did. It was a 35 foot rib, a very capable um, boat in, in rough sea states. But when we were driving back, we were going head on into gusting winds that were, you know, 50 knots. That boat could flip 
um, going over a wave, it could flip back. So the boat captain was very cautious, took us in slow, and there's no way we were going to go back to get those other two vehicles. We were done. Well, but we can tell the vehicles what to do. So we went into port, we had them swim to us. So at one knot, our prototype wave gliders made their way into these 40 knot, 50 knot gusting winds, and they made it the two miles, and we went out into the calm harbor and picked them up. Um, now, th something about the way they move into the, the waves, there, there's, this, there's this bifurcation, you know, it's, it's calmer down below than it is at the top, that's one thing. Um, there's also just an uh, interesting thing about the cyclicality of the motion. So if you're going into a wave, on the downstroke, the sub tends to dive forward. Then on the upstroke, it tends to hook in and pull the float through the, the crest of the wave. The, the float will actually dive and go through the white cap, like a surfer would break through a breaking wave. It's pulling with a tremendous force at that moment. So, so at, at that moment, the energy expenditure from the vehicle might be in the thousands of watts if you were to try and do that with a conventional thruster. Now then, it, it eases down the backslide, but it's automatically repeating this, this cycle of pulling the float through these uh, white caps over and over again. We don't have any control over it. It's all passive, and, uh, and it's what makes the thing work. Um, during the time that we were developing Wave Glider, and actually before it, um, there was a parallel program to develop a similar thing that was uh, funded by DARPA. And they had slightly different objectives, and they had different ways of doing it, but some of the approaches that were uh, developed in that program were sail, sailing vessels. And of course, you know, for all the remarkable things that we say about 100% energy harvesting and all that, well, sailboats have been around for a long time. They're the same 100% energy harvesting. Um, however, when the conditions get rough, and you're talking about a small vessel, the winds pick up, so does the sea state. A small sailboat is, has to tack to hold station. So you're going at high surface speeds in rough conditions, and it gets untenable pretty quickly. So, the, so a remarkable thing about the wave glider, we've been able to get it to work in these calm conditions. It also works in very rough conditions, too. So a wide range of conditions that, the, that it's able to operate. Has it got a very high buoyancy so that it can't itself dive? Um, we, you can, that's something that you want to moderate, actually, a little bit. So um, it does have a high buoyancy because that's where it gets its, uh, you know, the upstroke is from, from the buoyancy. But you'd like it to not necessarily stay on top of that, that, that white gap wave. So um, it will actually, you know, we adjust these things so that it will actually break through the tops of those waves and go under. Um, uh, now to this crowd, there's nothing remarkable about what we're doing here. <laughs> um, but uh, satellite communications, and we use Iridium, enable us to stay in touch with the vehicle uh, globally. Um, the internet, of course, is, is the other end. So wherever we are uh, and wherever the wave glider is, we can communicate and give it commands. Um, the, the user interface is a very early version of the web-based user interface. Um, it's actually uh, um, layered on top of a, uh, a NOAA map here. It's showing two vehicles going around a course. So we can create a waypoint. Um, these, uh, we call them breadcrumbs, are the position reports of the vehicle. In this case, I think they were two minutes apart. Um, parallel courses like this are a useful actually way for us to evaluate the vehicles when we make uh, changes to them. Um, this is a, 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 little bit, a little bit corny, I admit, but it, it was a, a, a card that, holiday card that we sent out um, last year. Um, not sky riding, ocean riding, I suppose. The font size here is a quarter mile. Um, this is four different vehicles. Um, this one, the U, had uh, four waypoints, and it just repeated that. So we layered these breadcrumbs on top of each other. The green one, we actually had to set up multiple courses to try to get a bushy uh, wreath here. Um, but uh, I guess you know, the, the point of it is you think that wave motion, it's directional, that these things would be getting pushed around, that they'd be surfboards. They're not. We can, we can control them quite precisely. Um, the, the float is where is the primary space for payloads. You can put payloads on the, on the sub. You can tow things. But the primary uh, space where most people want to put their payload is in the float. So our float is designed with hollow chambers underneath the solar panels. These hollow chambers are, are boxes. So Liquid Robotics will provide standard boxes that are waterproof. That They have the uh, waterproof connectors um, already done. We have pressure monitoring, leak monitoring, humidity, and temperature, um, and a standard interface so that people can develop payloads to go inside of the box. Um, alternatively, you can just have the space and hack away. Um, the, Center space is occupied by the core electronics module. Um, it has Iridium GPS uh, in this bubble, also lights uh, and uh, XB for uh, uh, wireless, so we can uh, program it via computer on a boat um, without 
paying for the satellite and also waiting for the, the delays. Um, we have lithium ion batteries. Um, uh, earlier versions actually used uh, lead acid batteries for ballast down on the sub. Um, but we uh, elected to go with lithium ion batteries and move that up closer to the, actually the source of power, the, the solar panels, and where the primary uh, drains are, the payloads. Yes? Can you detail more about the power budget? Yeah. Because this is probably OK for a temperate latitude. Mm -hmm. But as you begin to approach the poles, which is where you really want to take things, yeah. you're dealing with lower sun angles. And the That's like, a good you, segue. How do you deal with long, like six month winters, as an example? Yeah, good segue. I'll, let me get to that. So this, this is a plot of available solar energy. Um, this is uh, an REL data. Um, this is solar energy kilowatt hours per meter squared per day uh, on a horizontal flat surface considering weather effects. Um, let's say you're in Seattle. In June, you have 5.6 kilowatt hours per day per meter. January, you have one. Um, so let's take that to January in Seattle. Um, there's a conversion of units here, I apologize for. This is watt hours per meter, so divide by 1,000. So one kilowatt hour here, go down this column. Um, we have two nominally 43 watt solar panels. The panels that we're using are 12% efficient. So th there's better technologies available now. We wanted to go with a proven COTS panel. This one's designed for buoys. It's waterproof. It's very durable. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a starting point. But one way of getting more energy here is you know, there's solar panels that are probably twice as efficient or more. Um, uh, so that gives you an 86 nameplate, 86 watt nameplate uh, uh, rating. You account for a number of things, aging, obscura, salt, slime, and you get down to, uh, let's see, we're on this column, uh, two watts average continuous power available for everything. Um, the core system as it is right now, uses about 0.7 watts when it's in full bore. So we're using satellite, using the iridium quite frequently, and we're using the rudder as much as we need to. That's the core system. That gives you a 1.4 watt uh, available power budget for your payload in Seattle in January. Um, this says theoretical, um, is th this is a, a, an old slide. We, we actually have quite a bit of data now to, to validate this, and we need to update this slide. But this, this ended up being a pretty accurate estimate of the reality. Um, so. That, that means, you know, it's not a ton of power, uh, obviously, but there's still a lot that you can do with 1.4 watts average continuous. You're storing a 650 watt hour set of seven lithium ion batteries. So you can, you know, run that down during peak periods and then charge it up. If you have payloads that <coughs> need much more than that, you can also think about doing two vehicles and do a round <coughs> robin. Um, uh, cycle one through and then do another one. Yes? Velocity to shading by water and mass, does that include the percentage of time the panels are covered during the dive of each wave? Yeah, so there's a, it's a fudge factor because it, that depends a little bit on, on conditions. So this was a, an, a, an engineering estimate, a, bu a, a budget, and, uh, um, but, and that was uh, you know, considered that it's going to be underwater a certain amount of time. Um, fortunately, the panels, uh, fouling on the panels has, in our testing has not proven to be a big problem. Um, the, the, and that has to do with their position and placement, and, and, uh, um, and they're doing, but they were doing quite well on that. I was yeah. more concerned about yeah. the percentage of time. You have significant water over the panel as you're going through the top of the wave. Yeah, that's right. That's not a significant portion of the time, generally. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's really, we're just trying to do that during the peaks of the waves. And, and when that's happening, that's often very bad weather, so it's cloudy anyway. <laughs> um, and yeah, yeah. So actually, um, I'll do this in a slightly different order than I got the slides. The, um, uh, this is not, not, not my chart. It's, it's borrowed from uh, 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 Mr. Agiv here. But I, this is an interesting uh, chart to your point earlier about high latitudes and, and winter. Um, the interesting thing here is that if you look by month, sun and wind are reciprocals. Now, waves and wind correlate very, very well. So sun and waves will be nearly reciprocal. Um, in uh, June, you get a lot of sun, not much wind. In December, you get a lot of wind and not much sun. Also, by latitude. Um, high latitudes, not much sun, a lot of wind. Low latitudes, not much wind, a lot of sun. Wouldn't it be nice to have a system that uses wind and waves? Um, or, or, excuse me, wind and waves and sun. Um, the amount of wave energy that's available, um, uh, this is for a 45-pound vehicle. That's actually about half the size of what we typically make them. But um, uh, if you're in six-second waves, one-meter wave height, you've got about 45 watts that's available for extraction. 
Um, some of that's going into thrust, but there's, there's left over there that we could be converting into electrical energy. And so that's a development project that is, is, is in, in the roadmap to take some of the wave energy and also turn that into electricity because that would really greatly expand the operational ability in high latitudes um, and, and winter time. Yeah. What sort of efficiency of the total energy available in, in um, wave action? So that's not an easy question to answer, actually. And, and we're doing uh, quite a bit of uh, analysis right now to get to an efficiency number. So I'd rather not, not put a number out there. But it's, uh, it's, it's, you're not the first person to ask. Um, but it's not an easy one for us to answer, actually. Um, uh, Solar panels are more or less efficient. Uh, well, I think we're more efficient than the solar panels, actually. So I'll say that. Um, yeah. In, in low latitudes, uh, summertime, with the amount of, uh, with the average sea temperatures that you get, what's the highest temperature that your lithium ion batteries uh, experience ambient? Um, so in the ocean, that's generally not a problem. The, the, um, because we're, we, and we constructed the dry box out of aluminum. Um, that's not, uh, you know, you'd like it to be plastic from a fouling point of view, but we decided to deal with um, the potential galvanic corrosion, but use aluminum because of its uh, thermal conductivity. So the, the, the dry box is soaked in water. So if you're in a tropical clime that's, you know, where the water's 90 degrees, um, maybe you'd have some, some issue there. But, but really, um, that doesn't appear to be a factor. Well, that is a factor is, my, my yeah. My concern is mm -hmm. just that lithium mm -hmm. ion, the mm -hmm. long-term damaging thing is ambient temperature. Right, right. And so where we have to be careful is on the deck of the ship um, and in storage. And uh, I don't have the numbers in the, off the top of my head, but that is, uh, is definitely a relevant concern. 90, by the way, is yeah. getting up there. That's, yeah. that's into the uh, uh, right. double-digit percentage loss per year. OK, yeah. Well, and, and honestly, when in the present uh, design of the vehicle, now the, the longevity of all of these factors are things that the engineering is ongoing and there's you know, a continuous improvement process. But the lithium-ion battery will always be a limiter on the, on the useful life of the vehicle. Um, it's not a black and white thing. They degrade gradually. But, um, but if you want to have a vehicle out for five years, um, lithium ion batteries may not be the, uh, the best technology presently. Um, um, so um, I, I, that, I guess that, that's all I have in this presentation on, on you know, waves and, and, and sun energy and the energy budget of the system. Um, just a, a quick recap before I um, talk about some of the, uh, um, uh, the development history and the applications. Um, so, um, I think I made all of these points. Um, I guess the main thing is if you're harvesting energy now, even if, it's a, even if it's not very fast, your mission, since the longevity doesn't have a hard limit, your distance also doesn't. So you can travel a long distance to an area of operation. So instead of taking a ship there, you can drop it off from a port or from a boat uh, somewhere else and have it travel to the area of operation. Um, likewise, you have a sensor failure, you can have the vehicle come back for repair. So this is where the, op the cost really benefit really comes into play, is that the, you're eliminating the need for a ship to transit to a distant area. So it really enables operations in wide parts of the ocean that really may not have been economically feasible in the past. Um, at this point, I would say it's real. We've been working, um, uh, I've been working on this since 2005. Um, our existing test fleet has traveled about 42,000 nautical miles. The longest uh, 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 mission, 6,200 uh, uh, nautical miles, and, uh, and a separate mission over 10 months. Um, um, it, we haven't completed the design so that you can actually kick the thing out of, out of the back of an airplane. Um, but uh, uh, there's no fundamental reason why that couldn't be done. Yeah. What's the direction cross-section of inner troops? Um, well, uh, so the, uh, an integration that we're in the process of right now is uh, uh, AIS. So container ships will be broadcasting their position via the automatic identification system. It's a transceiver system that um, all ships internationally carry. Um, United States is actually you know, uh, behind the rest of the world in the implementation of AIS. It's uh, implemented on very small craft uh, worldwide. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it was the essence of it is for collision avoidance. Um, it's a line of sight system, so uh, you, can't, you can't easily get the data via satellite. You have to be within line of sight. But they're broadcasting their, their position and where they're going. The wave glider can receive that, and we'll be able to try and get out of their way. Uh, and 
if we hit a container ship, <laughs> the container ship won't notice. Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we will. And uh, although it would be, it, you know, it's not a test we've done, but it, I wouldn't be too surprised if the bow wave just didn't push us out of the way with a ship that of a container ship size. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I thought um, this being Stanford, it might be interesting to talk a little bit about the development history uh, with an audience of undoubtedly entrepreneurs and uh, inventors. Um, uh, liquid Robotics, um, uh, we have our test and operations facility in Hawaii. We have our, our headquarters is here in Palo Alto. Um, it was born in Hawaii um, through the work of the Jupiter Research Foundation. Um, Jupiter Research Foundation is a very small nonprofit um, uh, group that got interested in listening to whales in Hawaii. If you, if you go out to Hawaii, um, actually coming, the whales will be arriving soon. It's the, the winter months in Hawaii. You snorkel, you dive down, you'll hear the, the song of the whales and it can be quite mesmerizing. You have to remember to come back up and take a breath. Um, uh, Jupiter Foundation was interested in uh, transmitting the whale sound live out over the internet. And so uh, this is one of their um, early buoys. It's got a solar panel. It's got a radio, VHF radio transmitter. Um, transmits up to a, a repeater on the hill, and that goes out on the internet. Um, close to shore, uh, you hear waves breaking, and you hear uh, this sound that sounds like frying bacon, which is actually snapping shrimp. So you need to get away from shore. Um, it ends up, that, and now putting a, mo a, a moored buoy away from shore is more complicated than you might think. So the Jupiter guys started thinking about is there an easier way of doing this? Could we have a remote control boat that we would, would drive out with our hydrophone and then we'd drive it back? But the power budget really just didn't add up. So what about solar panels on the remote control boat? Well, then what about when it's dark at night and when it's, and it's windy, the solar panels become a liability? So they were thinking of ways of doing a station-keeping, whale-listening hydrophone. Um, uh, I got involved. I heard they, uh, uh, Joe, who's the... Uh, the uh, head of Jupiter Foundation contacted my father, their old friends, and, and uh, who's a, my father's also a mechanical engineer. The group of us started brainstorming and we came up with all of these ideas. Um, uh, um, this is one of the early models that I built, um, a, a, a flapping winged uh, device. Um, this is a, uh, let's see if it's a little video clip of an early test apparatus that I built. Um, in this video, there's a sliding rail here with a motor and a crank arm on it. Uh, this is free to slide. Um, and let's see here. So the energy input is through this little gear motor driving the crank, replicating wave motion. The thrust is coming from this guy down below, which pulls it along. And it's, you know, as you can see, it's remarkably even uh, pace. Um, this little prototype with a styrofoam float was operable in a swimming pool. And, uh, and that was really, you know, kind of one of the, the light bulb motion moments was when I brought this prototype over to Joe's swimming pool and uh, um, we, uh, we had it swim around. And I, I brought a bucket so that I could make waves. Um, and uh, so I sat on the edge and made waves and it would hit the side of the pool and then I'd run around and direct it to swim back. And Joe had the idea of if I bent this little flap at the back, it might do circles and then I wouldn't have to run across the pool every time. So we did that and then... I stopped making waves and we were all talking about what we just saw and what we might do with this concept. Um, and about 20 minutes later, we looked over and just from the wind ripple on the waves on the pool, it was still swimming around in circles. Um, and so it was, uh, it, you know, we knew at that point that we wanted to scale it up. So the thing on the rail there, is that just rotating and getting its thrust from the thing below? Um, that, exactly, okay. exactly. So there's, there's nothing pulling it along other than this vehicle down below, exactly. So you've got good strong IP on just this? Um, we have we have good strong IP on yeah and uh, it's uh, there's uh, I, I don't have much in this presentation about our IP strategy but yes uh, feel enough that we've that we're okay to uh, reveal this. <laughs> so can you guys uh, talk about like the Willow Garage people? Um, we we have a little bit I haven't myself but uh, but different people in the company have, have interacted with Willow Garage yeah yeah um, because they basically I was talking with them early on about hmm. wave motion and. They decided to go with, with sail, and yeah. sail and solar as opposed right. to wave and solar. So. Sure. Yeah. No, we're definitely not the only ones uh, um, right. interested in, in autonomous. We're talking to Australians too, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're talking to a large number of people. Yes. And uh, and we have, uh, you know, we're we're a little bit beyond the uh, the concept stage here. I'm going back in time, but we have uh, uh, revenues and, and customers and all of that. Um, so uh, this is an early prototype. It was a uh, biomimetic in inspiration. 
um, bundled up and uh, ready to launch here from shore. Um, one of the concepts and sort of the size of the vehicle is we'd like to have it be something that a couple people can handle. Um, another early prototype, um, one of the early prototypes, this literally was a surfboard with a dry box in Hawaii. Um, one of our, uh, you know, and one of the reasons why we stayed with operations in Hawaii is that, you know, year round you can do tests and, and, uh, and you can do rapid iteration. One of our techniques, in this case, uh, this is a shore launch, so launched off the beach. Swimmer guided out past the coral reef, then swims to a station where it holds station for a little while, and we had it go around a square course. Another vehicle that was nearby, we had go around the same course so that we could race them. So one of the techniques for um, improving the performance of the vehicles is, uh, is just that. Have two vehicles that you think are identical and race them, see if they are identical, then make changes. Um, and, uh, and really get to real world truth um, on uh, the validity of the design changes. Um, we uh, started showing uh, selected customers in 2007 and the capability of the concept. Um, this was uh, one of the vehicles that we did a demonstration on. Demonstration was in December and we decided just to leave it out. Um, pretty soon it uh, had some friends. Um, this was kind of remarkable because these are, these are full size, you know, three or four inch long um, gooseneck barnacles and there really wasn't anything else there. But they, they, they latched on and they grew to full size very quickly. Um, what happens at a given time, it's unpredictable. It just depends on what organisms are in the neighborhood and what the, the conditions are like. Um, so the next year something different might happen on the same, very same vehicle. We made no attempt to curtail this, by the way. This was just, these, this was ordinary paint, no effort to, uh, to have anti-felling. Uh, That's right, yeah. It's, well, I mean, of course, yeah. Just curious, are the barnacles yeah. selectively attracted to things that move because it aids the feeding? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how they, they find their way around. The, um, uh, because, you know, how do they, yeah, how do they find the wave glider to latch on? Um, there, there, I think there's just a lot of the, the, the spore, if you will, um, out there. Uh, but there's actually, I don't, I, I don't think I have the picture in here, but there's a vicious looking creature that looks just like a centipede that eats these things. And it has to somehow find the thing that the, the, they're all attached on and then make its home there. And when we took this thing out, um, the one thing in Hawaii that is a little scary are the centipedes. They'll, they'll really get you. Um, and so we took off the solar panel and there was this sort of water centipede. Um, and it's a, it was a, a fireworm that eats uh, uh, the, uh, the gooseneck barnacles. Um, but, uh, um, the, it, it's, it's, it is pretty, I'm not a biologist, but it, it is very interesting watching the biology um, uh, around these things. Good news here, solar panels, uh, you can see some salt scum uh, that'll get washed off the next time it's wavy, uh, but the fouling really wasn't developing on the panels. Um, and a different organism, uh, the sponge came a little bit later, and uh, you jump in and there's always, you know, a different group of fish uh, that were uh, swimming around it. Sometimes you'd see some of the same ones you'd seen before, but uh, it became, they do become uh, fads, fish aggregation devices. Um, and so uh, the fishermen do use them and uh, um, that's just the way it is. The good news is, um, uh, oh, so we had set ourselves a target of 120 days and this was uh, when it passed it. Um, the good news is even encumbered like this, it was still operating. So it was still able to hold station. It was definitely slower than it was without all the barnacles, but it was still able to operate. Um, and the other good news is that there are anti-fouling treatments that will uh, dramatically slow the growth. Here in Hawaii, in this particular area, in this uh, environment, it's a high growth area. So other areas, particularly when you get farther away from shore, um, they will be less biologically rich, less of a biofouling problem. Well, actually, one of the things with the high latitudes is that when you get to an area like a convergence zone, yeah. so you could sail for a while in the, the, the warmer temperate waters and then turned into the polar areas and you could kill off of the things that stop you. Yeah. Um, you could use biological techniques like the fireworm. If we could, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, fruit, <laughs> you know, although our one fireworm, I think we'd have to fire him because there were a lot of particles still on there and he was not fat enough. Um, I think we needed a few more of them. Um, uh, that's right. Um, so we've, we've got a lot of activities uh, going on. Some of them are, are you know, customer related and, and, I, and uh, uh, um, I, I, I won't go into those too much, but um, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the story of, of our favorite engineering system right now. Well, we like all our, our, our children, but Red Flash has certainly been 
um, one of the more successful engineering systems that we have. Um, the first big sort of uh, letting them out of our test area mission that we did um, was the circumnavigation of the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, this is 343 nautical miles. Red Flash took about nine days to make that voyage. Um, and uh, quite rough uh, seas in this area. One thing about this area, so this is where our, our shop is in Kauai Hai. But one thing that's great about this area for testing what, the wave-powered vehicle, I, m I mentioned the fact that year-round we can get out there. But also, the prevailing conditions from the northeast means that these side, this side of the islands are quite cliffy and jagged, and there's often very rough sea states. The channel between the Big Island and Maui um, is legendarily rough. Um, it's not a good place to take a small craft. So we have this very rough water available to us to test in. In this little uh, uh, bay here, it's on the lee side, and it's often very, very calm. So you, you have a wide range of conditions to uh, test and operate in. What are the legal implications to the owner of one of these things out? Yeah, there's not a lot of, um, uh, uh, there, there's a, um, of law about autonomous ocean vehicles. And uh, um, so there aren't, uh, there aren't many legal precedents, and there are um, responsibilities to be responsible. Um, in, uh, in this case, we uh, were in international waters. Um, and so there aren't a lot of, you know, certainly not local regulations, but there are the international uh, rules of the sea. So, um, uh, that's, but that's a, uh, there's, uh, there are, there's definitely work being done to get the legal precedent. But when we first talked to the Coast Guard about what we were doing in Hawaii, we actually, we, we talked to a number of agencies about, you know, 12 different agencies about what we were doing and, you know, could, would they permit us to do it? Um, and the Coast Guard was, well, <laughs> you know, they don't have a class for it. It's, 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 it's not a, you know, we got instructions at first that we, they would like to have a 15 candela light with the, you know, uh, you know, universal coverage, seven degree, oh, the spec, and we built this light, but then it was, wait, wait, somebody else at the Coast Guard realized, no, no, that, that, that would mean that you're a vessel, um, and there might be a person on a vessel. You're not a vessel, there's no person on this. So, uh, no, maybe you're closer to marine debris. Well, we don't like that either. <laughs> we don't really like that either because marine debris is, you know, so there isn't really a class for small autonomous vehicle that's uh, in the uh, collision regulations right now. So uh, that is a uh, an open open issue. Um, How much? I mean, you can't even tip over a kayak with it if it runs into you. Well, that, that's part of the that's part of our thinking is just keep it small, and, and then it's then it's less of an issue. If you get if you get really big, um, then it's more of a, a, a collision threat. But um, that's right for and that that was ultimately where the the, the Coast Guard in Hawaii came, came was they wanted us to keep it in a certain area so they could put out notice to mariners. Um, they wanted us to, to do different things. And this was all uh, two years ago, and we've been following um, the guidelines and without an incident. Um, but uh, it's, you know, potentially could be, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough to say. It's, it's for most vessels running into something like this, it would not be an incident. And there's certainly things floating around in the ocean of a similar size that, that you should be careful about if you're a mariner. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, plastic. Well, so I, I don't have it in this deck, but we did send a couple vehicles from Hawaii to California recently. And so from Hawaii to California, you go straight through the garbage batch. Um, and uh, we didn't get tank. <laughs> well, right. Um, we, we didn't, you know, this was a vehicle test, so we didn't have cameras. Uh, uh, regret, regretting that. Uh, they did document the garbage batch in that you take off the solar panels and there were bottle caps and, and little pieces of uh, debris there. Um, but when they made it to San Diego and uh, we pulled them out, it was, uh, it was definitely a beautiful moment. I mean, we've been working very hard for, for a long time to try and make something that is capable of, of doing something like that. I, I dove in and, and swam with it, and they looked totally pristine, just you know, ready to turn around and go back. Um, uh, so that was beautiful. Also, they were enveloped with a school of anchovy. Um, so I was s swimming around with these, this, sh this shiny cloud of fish all around, and it was a, a, a moment of revelry. Um, underwater. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Well, they started to swim around me, and then I realized, or I, I started to think, what eats anchovies? Um, and I got out. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, nothing too bad eats anchovies, but I didn't want to. That's right. Uh, well, um, more news coming on that. Um, I, I, I won't announce right now, but we are definitely looking at some uh, grander challenges. So. Uh, Speed over ground. Uh, yeah. uh, so that's actually an interesting thing, is that speed over ground is readily available from GPS, but speed through water is a little bit more complicated to get. Um, so 
we do have water speed sensors on uh, more recent vehicles, uh, actually oh, well, on Red Flash. Um, and uh, actually the difference between speed through the water and speed over ground uh, is an interesting piece of oceanographic data right there. Um, the inference is about the currents. Um, uh, uh, so uh, also you can turn it into a drifter by just doing circles. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I think that we may uh, hit the bottom of our time, so I'm gonna skip through this a little bit. Um, we, we did some testing with Red Flash in Monterey Bay in April of this year. Monterey Bay is perhaps the best instrumented piece of ocean on the planet. Uh, um, uh, be, uh, and that's in, we have Scripps in Southern California, we have Imbari, uh, the Monterey Bay Area Research Institute, that are doing extensive studies in Monterey Bay. So we wanted to do some testing there to calibrate our instrumentation. Um, we um, operated near the Imbari uh, M1 and M2 buoys. Um, these are state-of-the-art data buoys with uh, state-of-the-art weather stations that we, we thought we could trust to, uh, to calibrate uh, ours. So we operated near the buoys for a little while and then uh, moved on. Um, one of the things that um, uh, maybe is a little counterintuitive about the wave glider versus a buoy is that, um, okay, so we don't have a way of stopping. The vehicle is always moving forward. Um, to station keep, the algorithm is, you know, swim and then swim towards the target. Um, and just do that again. Um, and do that again, do that again, do that again. So it doesn't need to be anything more complicated than that. Um, we end up keeping station, this is a conservative uh, uh, case, 50 meter radius. So 50 meter radius, that may not seem like that small of an area, but on ocean scales, um, that really is. Um, if you look at what a data buoy does, um, uh, this is the 1.75 uh, or 1.7 kilometer watch circle for the uh, M2 buoy. Now there isn't really a reason for them to, to reduce the scope of that. And there are ways of, of, of mooring a buoy so that it is, it is more precise. In this case, it's not important. Um, the value of it, so this is our 50 meter radius relative to the 1.7 kilometer. The value of that will be in cases where we, um, you do, there are cases where you want careful positioning um, and uh, uh, one of them is where you're acoustically communicating to something down below. What's the depth there? Um, you know, um, I forget. Um, I think it's about um, 1,500 meters, but I forget. Is there any use case in which you want to do an actual physical contact rendezvous? Um, uh, possibly, yeah, possibly, definitely. Um, we, after we calibrated the sensor, we sent the vehicle down south. Um, we plotted a course, went down to the, uh, uh, um, uh, the border with Mexico, and then uh, went in for an inspection. Um, one, of the, um, uh, you know, one of the other questions is, you know, is, is collision vandalism. Um, uh, what will people do to this piece of equipment that's out in the ocean? Um, we knew where Red Flash was. We picked a part of the ocean that was out in international waters where there wasn't a lot of activity where it was going to be out of the way. Um, and then we went out and did our inspection. It turns out that you know, the middle of nowhere is a place that a lot of people would like to go. Um, and, uh, and so we were in the middle of the nowhere, and so, it, so was somebody else. We saw where our vehicle was. We saw a boat. We saw water spray. Um, and I thought whales. We're used to whales. And then we saw something that looked like the Bellagio. <laughs> Fountains going up. Um, I saw, we saw a blue thing in the water. We saw our red thing in the water, red flash. Um, we weren't sure what was going on. The boat then turned to us, and we saw the machine gun on the front of it. Um, uh, they were motoring towards us. We didn't know what they were. They got a little bit closer. We saw it was Coast Guard. Um, they were doing you know, firing practice in a safe, out-of-the-way area. Um, and uh, <laughs> was that? Well, so they didn't shoot us. Um, I appreciate their restraint in that because it must have been tempting. <laughs> they did not shoot Red Flash, and uh, um, they said, is that your red thing? Um, <laughs> we, we coyly said, yeah. Um, and they said, well, we tried to move it. And they had picked it up, and they dragged it away, and then went back to the, but of course, we had told it to stay <laughs> in the station. Uh, so... Uh, they were they were just sort of ignoring it, and I think I, I don't know I don't know what they do. I think they practice missing. You know, they're not actually trying to hit the target because they would destroy it, but they're just I, I don't know. But uh, we picked it up and we moved it away, uh, uh, and uh, and we relaunched it and it swam back up. Um, they didn't. No, they, you know uh, I think they were 
ready to go back and shoot some more. Um, <laughs> looked like fun. Um, so how close did you get that the sackcloth empty? That's where they trained the seals. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah. We, I, so we were, I mean, we were, I, I would say how close, I don't know, 15, 20 miles. But yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah, probably getting a little closer. I'm probably wondering, it's like, yeah. who <laughs> is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So we've, um, more recently, we, we, we took Red Flash back in. We upgraded. We gave it the water speed sensor, um, uh, and uh, we upgraded the firmware with some things. That, keep in mind, this is an engineering vehicle, so we're still um, making design changes on this particular one. Um, and uh, we relaunched it. The KQED did a, uh, a new story on the California report. Hear about about it, and then we had it head north this time. Um, another ocean observation technique, uh, HF radar, it gives you some very interesting uh, information about surface currents. Um, there's a mesoscale eddy um, off Mendocino, um, which at this time was very pronounced. So we saw that in the HF radar and decided to use it to our advantage and rode up the uh, that side of it and shot through this area quite quickly. Um, the we made it to, the, to uh, um, you know, the north uh, edge of the United States, and we decided that um, we would keep on going and start getting some information about some higher latitudes. Um, we did go all the way up to the Alaska border, um, or this is uh, uh, offshore, but, but what would be the equivalent of the Alaska border offshore? Um, and a storm came in, uh, a pretty significant storm. Um, this is where Red Flash was during uh, the storm on September 23rd. Uh, wind gusts um, uh, were, well, what do we have here? 82 miles an hour gusts, uh, steady winds, 60 miles an hour, 22 foot or 7 meter waves. Keep in mind that's about the length of the umbilical. So um, very significant conditions. And the, and the great news was uh, it's, uh, it was holding station and, and doing exactly what we told it to, even in those conditions. Um, uh, the... Um, we have had events with Red Flash along this mission, and we have had uh, and uh, uh, had some uh, interesting repairs. In this case, the weather station was zapped with a, uh, atmospheric ESD. I guess that's lightning, low calorie lightning. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, the there has we have made some, or the manufacturers actually made some modifications to the sensor to improve the shielding um, and grounding so that it would resist uh, a similar event in the future. Um, but we swapped out the uh, the weather sensor and relaunched it. Uh, it had actually, um, just before our recovery, it had actually picked up some kelp. Um, it's not the first time that happens. It slows it down. Uh, these kelp patties are out there, uh, and, uh, but it, it generally sheds the kelp within hours or, uh, or uh, you know, a day or so. Um, and then uh, this was a repair that we did uh, uh, um, up at the north end of its uh, trip in uh, Graham Island. Uh, these boaters tend to like to leave in the middle of the night, so uh, do things in the early morning. Um, I'll just uh, just quickly um, go through some of the things that we're working on right now. Um, I spoke about gateway applications um, uh, briefly before. Um, the electromagnetic energy really doesn't propagate in salt water um, or any any you know meaningful distance for ocean observation purposes. Um, so uh, while GPS and satellites and 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 cameras and everything work great on the surface. Below the surface, you have to think of alternative ways of communicating. Acoustics, on the other hand, the speed of sound is five times faster underwater than it is um, through air, and acoustics become a, a good way of communicating. So the wave glider positioned at the surface is a great link between the acoustic undersea world and the electromagnetic above sea world. Um, the tsunami warning system, the DART tsunami warning system, the deep area, uh, 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 deep area reporting an assessment of tsunamis, tsunami starting with a T, um, uh, is what the acronym stands for. Uh, the DART system has the, the key piece of, or maybe the most uh, specialized piece of technology is the uh, bottom pressure recorder. This is a very sensitive pressure sensor uh, that will measure the height of the water column within centimeter accuracy. It likes to be in deep parts of the ocean, so it might be four miles below the surface. Um, it's looking for a particular frequency, low amplitude wave that is a tsunami. Now it knows that there's a tsunami. It's four miles below the surface of the water, maybe 100 miles off the coast. How does it tell anybody? Um, so the logistical challenge of this system is to get that message out. Running a cable would be one way. Um, the way that this system is designed is that there is a buoy at the surface. Um, you could run a cable up, that, up to that buoy, um, but that actually would be a lot more difficult than running an acoustic modem 
um, because the, these things are not going to be exactly the same spot. You want them anchored at a different spot so that when you account for currents, the, the buoy is relatively uh, close to being above the, the bottom pressure recorder. Um, the, the, the really, you know, the ongoing maintenance cost of the system, and this system has been tremendously successful. It was launched very rapidly in response to the uh, Indonesian tsunami um, and deployed um, uh, around the world. The key thing about tsunami warning system is uh, actually really uh, avoiding false alarms um, so that you know when there's not a tsunami coming. Um, and, uh, and the system's been quite successful at that. Um, but wave gliders are, we're working with SAIC and, uh, and the National Data Buoy Center um, uh, 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 and actually Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, uh, who is the original group that deployed the DART system, um, on having the wave glider be a backup to the already deployed surfaced systems. So if one goes down, you can have a wave glider go out there and do the same function. Um, uh, so we, we did a demonstration earlier this spring, and we're continuing on that, uh, that path so that we'll have wave letters as a backup. Um, acoustics um, generally are a, you know, it's a great acoustic observation platform. Um, marine mammal uh, uh, researchers, whale researchers are, um, uh, you know, very excited about the possibilities of wave letter. Um, we're working with uh, uh, scripts. Uh, with our high-frequency acoustic recorder, their harp uh, recorder, to integrate that on a wave ladder and uh, make acoustic measurements for uh, marine mammals. Was that? You couldn't keep up with the wave. Right. Um, uh, CO2. I, I mentioned uh, CO2 earlier. Um, the uh, we're working now with uh, Pacific Marine Environmental Lab again up in Seattle. Uh, NOAA's uh, environmental lab to uh, provide a CO2 measurement system um, uh, using technology that they've developed for ships initially, then buoys, now being miniaturized even farther to go on a wave glider. So this measures the partial pressure of CO2 in the air, and actually the same sensor measures the partial pressure of CO2 in the water by equilibrating air with, wa with the water and then running it through the same sensor. It carries calibrated uh, tanks of air to recalibrate that sensor. And uh, it has uh, other sensors to, to validate that information. So um, it's a way of measuring or inferring the CO2 flux, um, how much CO2 is going into the ocean or coming out of the ocean at a given spot. The fact that it's a mobile platform means that now you can have this, um, you know, large numbers and cost effectively, and you can reposition them potentially in response to observations made from satellites or other systems. Um, so to observe a particular phenomenon. So uh, we're really excited about the uh, future of that program. Um, this is showing um, some of the other sensors that um, uh, are relevant to, uh, to that measurement. Um, I mentioned, and I, I should say, I mentioned the, you know, the biology of the ocean being you know, relatively difficult to observe. Um, CO2 is one physical variable. CO2 and oxygen are one physical variable that relate um, very strongly to the biological activity. And so that this is, it, while it's not a direct biological observation, it is a useful one for understanding the biology of the ocean. Sure. Yeah. Has anyone asked you to uh, make a version that would monitor methane? Um, we, we've... <coughs> yeah. No, no, and I actually, actually, you know, the reason why I'm doing this, this talk and, and, and we're doing this type of exposure is exactly that, that type of, of, of question. It's, um, you know, Liquid Robotics is an engineering company. We're not, a, we're not a science company. We're not really an oceanographic company. We're an engineering company working on a new apparatus. And so really, the, it's, it's, if, if uh, measuring methane is, um, is of interest, we need to find the, the, the right group of people and get them together to work on a uh, payload to do that. But I, that, I think that that would be a very interesting one. And, and, and not to my knowledge do we have anything actively working in that area. Because some interest uh, seems to be rising in, in uh, Methane cleft uh, prospecting. Right, that's right. So and uh, hydrocarbons certainly as well. Just uh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there are mm -hmm. significant reports of high methane concentrations mm -hmm. in high latitudes. Right. Because of uh, of the warming of the lower sea temperature or sea, that which too. releasing methane hydrate. Right. Yes. So. Um, we, we have, um, <coughs> there's talk about a you know, mass spectrometer type system for, uh, for measuring uh, chemical constituents and, and other methods of hydrocarbon measurement. But um, at this point, I, I don't believe we have an active project. 
Um, uh, um, but I, I will say, our, our business development crew has enough conversations going on with enough people who are interested in doing various tests that I, I'm not cognizant of all of them myself. It's hard to keep up. Uh, this is one um, uh, acoustic topic profile, uh, current profiler integration um, that we just did recently. This was, you know, just a quick hack to, uh, but I, I included just to show, you know, so we've got these payload boxes, but you've also just got, you know, it's a float. The float has, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't have any moving parts. It's, uh, it, you can change the shape of it. You can do a lot with it. Um, uh, in this case, we drove around a, bo a square box for a little while running the ADCP. <coughs> And uh, this is some of the averaged data. The main, the cyclicality that you see here is actually the vehicle going in different directions on the legs of the box. If you take that out of it by, by you know, through the GPS, then you start to see what the actual structure of the currents are below the surface. Um, uh, in this case, we ran it uh, again in a shallower area so that we could actually track the bottom. Um, so the ADCP has the ability to measure the movement of the bottom as well as the water in between the itself and the in the bottom and act smoothed and compensated for the vehicle's motion and you start to see some actually very interesting current profiles um, here at a depth of 30 meters the water is actually moving in the opposite direction of what it's doing at minus 10 meters um, a surface current measurement wouldn't have seen that so ADCPs are a, um, a really interesting technology for getting three-dimensional structure of currents uh, um, below the surface and uh, and the wave glider is going to be a great platform for uh, ADCPs Take an ADCP, add weather station potentially, and other sensors, and you've got a integrated uh, meteorological oceanographic sensor platform. Well, uh, suggested you control the length of your tether, it can turn back. <laughs> um, uh, it's at 20, whatever. You have now seven feet, and yeah. down at 20 goes the other way. Well, we're just turning the rudder <laughs> to go the other way. Um, uh, yeah. What is the speed of light? For these things. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's going to want to race it, so yeah. uh, well, when he shows up and says, "I want the fast one," so the um, I'll, I'll say that our focus has been on durability. Um, after you get to a certain speed where you can navigate around, then durability is key. Uh, having said that, and it may not sound like a lot to people who drive cars, but one and a half knots is a typical speed for a wave glider right now, and that's actually considerable compared to. Uh, um, other types of autonomous vehicles. So it's a very useful speed and it gives you a, a wide range of operation given the, the fact that ocean currents are you know, generally less than a quarter knot. There's obviously areas where they're quite a bit more than that and then you have to think about how you're going to navigate the vehicle and that's a little bit more than we can probably go into now. Um, I think I'll just kind of recap. Um, uh, battery life right now is the main limiter for autonomous vehicles in the ocean. Um, in, historically, they've really been, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of different work and applications for autonomous underwater vehicles, particularly, but they're generally relegated to nearship or nearshore operations. So getting the energy harvesting gives you a way of getting an autonomous vehicle um, in remote areas for long distances. Um, and uh, the wave glider's got continuous communications because it's a surface vehicle, um, and the operational area is most of the planet. Um, and so this really represents a fundamentally new capability um, and fundamentally new sensing applications. So um, we are at a point now where we've matured the platform enough that it, it's, it's time to be interacting with uh, the various oceanographic groups and, and scientific community to find what the right uh, most meaningful near-term applications are. We've got a, a strong set of them that I've presented to you here and there's more that I don't have time to, but um, we're really interested in soliciting others who are interested in doing research for this platform. So uh, with that, I'll uh, say thank you. So when I was in grad school, I had a, a, a professor named For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.